In this treaty, we seek to establish freedom from aggression and from the use of force in the North Atlantic community. This is the area which has been at the heart of the last two world conflicts. To protect this area against war will be a long step toward permanent peace in the whole world. Mons and Brussels, Belgium, this is an Enduring Alliance, a podcast reflecting on the 70-year history of NATO and its oldest military headquarters, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. Welcome back to An Enduring Alliance, our podcast series on the history of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and its oldest military headquarters, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE. Your hosts for today will be myself, Dr. Stella Adolf, the Chief Historical Advisor at SHAPE. And I'm Dr. Linda Risso, I'm a History Consultant at SHAPE. And I am U.S. Army Master Sergeant Alex Burnett, a SHAPE Media Operations Non-Commissioned Officer. Today we want to talk about a city of great interest during the Cold War. In our previous episodes, we talked about the end of World War II, the events leading to the creation of NATO and SHAPE, and a question prevailed through both of these episodes what to do about Germany. If you haven't listened to our previous two episodes, I highly recommend that you do, as they give an incredibly valuable background for what we will discuss today. In the 1950s and 1960s, both the Alliance and the Soviet Union started asking a new question. What about Berlin? But before we get into the specifics of Berlin, let's look at the situation in Europe, in particular that of NATO and Soviet-backed communism. By 1955, the alliance had grown, having brought the Federal Republic of Germany, Turkey and Greece in as members. Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe had a command structure in Allied Command Europe, with regional headquarters in Northern, Central and Southern Europe. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, Soviet-backed communism responded directly to the alliance and its expansion with its own grouping of nations. In 1955, the Soviet Union, the Romanian, Albanian, the German Democratic Republic or East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria came together to form a military alliance known as the Warsaw Pact. Under the supervision of this pact, the USSR would rearm East Germany with the formation of the National People's Army as a direct counter to the rearming of West Germany as a member of NATO. The Warsaw Pact have their own supreme commander, the first being the commander-in-chief of the Warsaw Pact forces, Ivan Konev, and their own agreements and plans on how to counter NATO. The Warsaw Pact would be the primary competitor of NATO throughout the Cold War, but we'll talk about this more in future episodes. And there, in the middle of this ever-heightening Cold War, is a city, Berlin. We are going to go back a few years now and rehash some familiar ideas. Germany was initially divided into four occupation zones, and so was its capital, Berlin. With the formation of NATO, the Western Allies merged their occupation zones into one. In May 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was founded with its capital city in Bonn. West Germany became a republic and adopted a free market capitalist economy. Only months later, East Germany became the German Democratic Republic, with a communist economy and East Berlin as its capital. Even in the early years of the Cold War, Berlin was a peculiar symbol of the two contesting sides. From day one, West Berlin was an island of freedom in a metaphorical ocean of communism, something that did not sit well with the Soviet Union and led them to consistently challenge the city's status. And that is how we ended up with situations like the 1948 Soviet blockade of West Berlin, which resulted in the first Berlin crisis and an airlift, as we discussed in our first episode. Although the Berlin airlift had successfully brought the blockade to an end without war, tensions never disappeared completely. The Soviet Union and the newly founded German Democratic Republic saw the very existence of West Berlin as a threat, and with good reason. Many East German citizens used the border in Berlin to cross to the Western sector, 
and from there to move over to other Western European countries. The number of East German citizens crossing to the West grew consistently in the years after the end of the Berlin blockade. It soon became a problem both in terms of the economic and demographic impact, as well as in terms of international prestige for the Soviet bloc. To provide some perspective, around 150,000 people crossed the border each year in the early 1950s. A whopping 331,000 crossed the border in 1953, following the death of Stalin and fear of further Sovietization of the East German society. By 1961, it is estimated that more than 3.5 million East Germans had fled to the West. In the aftermath of years of citizens fleeing East Germany, the beginnings of a second Berlin crisis took shape. Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union after the death of Joseph Stalin, searched for ways to end the constant emigration from the Warsaw Pact countries. He came to a dramatic conclusion, end the four-power occupation of Berlin. This is something that the Soviets had been discussing since 1952. But in 1958, it really became clear that neither the Soviet Union nor the German Democratic Republic were going to tolerate their citizens fleeing to the West. The damage to the communist regime's image would end, one way or another. Khrushchev gave Western Europe an ultimatum. Leave West Berlin in six months, or the Soviet Union will sign a separate unilateral peace treaty with the German Democratic Republic. I want to take a moment and highlight the severity of this situation. The conventional forces belonging to the Warsaw Pact nations were immense. If this treaty were signed, they would have had access to the entirety of this German territory, with the blessing of the East German government. In 1958, Khrushchev threatened to change the status of Berlin unilaterally and irreversibly. If the alliance intervened, they risked war. This left Berlin, its occupying forces, and NATO in a dangerous position. We've asked Diego Ruiz Palmer, an experienced NATO planner, to explain the strategic and operational challenges of defending West Berlin at this point. Now, operationally, West Berlin was geographically isolated in the middle of the German Democratic Republic. The only links with West Germany were rail and road uh, corridors, as well as three air corridors uh, through which uh, the three Western allies could uh, rotate forces and bring supplies uh, for the soldiers and their families. At the same time, um, Berlin was surrounded by some 90,000 Soviet and East German troops, so a very high concentration. Uh, this was part of a much larger uh, Soviet and East German military presence of what was then the, the first strategic echelon of the Warsaw Pact. And uh, uh, the Soviets and East Germans exercised uh, regularly uh, a plan uh, to uh, occupy West Berlin uh, in a war under an, an operation called Center. The three Western powers, again, France, uh, the United Kingdom, and the United States, had about 12,000 troops uh, together. So a very small military presence compared to the, so about 90,000 uh, Soviet and East German troops. These were under national command. They were not under the command of NATO. Colonel Adam Edmonds, currently an officer at SHAPE, was stationed in West Berlin as a young officer in the 1980s. And he still recalls vividly this sense of isolation. Being in Berlin gave you a unique perspective on, on the sort of Cold War. It was very real. Um, I think um, the strongest memory is the sense that we were very isolated. Um, the links to Western Europe uh, were pretty tenuous. There was the Berlin Corridor, uh, or flights, which obviously could be shut off at more or less uh, any time. So, I mean, we were very, very conscious that we were quite a long way um, behind the Iron Curtain. By 1959, the three NATO occupied nations in West Germany, the United States, Britain and France, realized the need for contingency plans in the defense of West Berlin. These plans were developed as a code name operation, Live Oak. The plans included military measures to keep the road, rail and air corridors between the Federal Republic of Germany and West Berlin open at all times. Live Oak developed plans that included a company-sized probe to test whether the Soviets were in fact stopping Allied access to Berlin. 
there would also be a larger battalion effort to demonstrate the Allies' determination to reopen the Axis routes if needed. There were also plans to keep maritime communication and supply lines open as well as air contingency plans. However, it is important to spell out that, in contrast to the Berlin crisis of 1948, Life Oak plans did not include the possibility of another airlift in case of a blockade. Also, remember this important fact. Live Oak was, and always remained, separate from shape. It was never a NATO-wide operation. However, there was a strong connection, of course. Any Live Oak contingency plan would have used NATO military and command and control structures. In addition, Live Oak was based on the very concepts of NATO forward defense and on the high readiness of conventional forces in the central region. Live Oak had another significant tie to NATO and shape in the form of its leader, U.S. Air Force General Loris Norstad, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. So, during this critical time in European history, General Norstad wore, so to speak, three hats. He was NATO SACUR, Commander-in-Chief of United States European Command, or U.S. SINCUR, and he was the Live Oak Commander. We've asked Gregory Pedlow for his evaluation of General Norstad's position at this point. General Norstad's position wearing three hats was a very difficult one. It's even today, it's not easy, easy for Sakir to wear two hats. He's very stretched between the two. Wearing three is a, almost an, an almost impossible task. He's responsible to different sets of leaders, sometimes overlapping, sometimes different. He had different amounts of authority. Uh, he had particular authorities as the U.S. Commander-in-Chief Europe. Uh, he had somewhat less authority as NATO Supreme Allied Commander in terms of what he could do without reference to the politicians. He had even less direct authority as Commander of Live Oak, where he could make recommendations, but ultimately every single action by Live Oak required political approval early on. And so he had different levels of responsibility, different people he reported to, and different levels of, of authority for what he could carry out. President John F. Kennedy Jr. was aware of the significance of West Berlin as a symbol of Western democracy, freedom, and the United States' commitment to the defense of Europe. In President Kennedy's own words, and I quote, West Europe is vital to our national security, and we have supported it in two wars. If we were to leave West Berlin, Europe would be abandoned as well. So when we are talking about West Berlin, we are also talking about West Europe. In March 1961, at the height of tensions between East and West, President Kennedy invited Willy Brandt, the mayor of West Berlin, to the White House. In an interview at the end of the meeting, Willy Brandt said, The president expressed the continued interest of the American people and government in Berlin. He reiterated the determination of the United States in cooperation with its allies to preserve and maintain the freedom of the people of West Berlin to which it is committed by treaty and convention. In the night of August 12, 1961, East German authorities began to seal off all access points to West Berlin by stringing barbed wire and by posting sentries. In the days and weeks to come, a brick wall began to rise with sentry towers, minefields, and a barren no man's land. The Berlin Wall was a fortified structure that completely sealed off West Berlin. It was designed with one purpose, to prevent East German citizens from crossing the border. The wall soon became a symbol of the Cold War, a wall dividing the West and the East, two opposing ideological, political, and economic worlds, completely separated from each other. The wall also became the symbol of a cruel dictatorship. Between 1861 and 1889, more than 100 East German fugitives were killed die by accident or committed suicide while trying to flee through the border fortifications. The decision to build the wall had been so sudden that families became separated with some members trapped in the eastern sector. People who tried to cross the border at the last minute were arrested. President Kennedy harshly criticized the Soviet Union and opposed the construction of the wall in harsh terms. We will at all times be ready to talk, if talk will help. But we must also be ready to resist with force if force is used upon us. Either alone would fail. Together they can serve 
the cause of freedom and peace. The new preparations that we shall make to defend the peace are part of the long-term buildup in our strength, which has been underway since January. They are based on our needs to meet a worldwide threat on a basis which stretches far beyond the present Berlin crisis. Our primary purpose is neither propaganda nor provocation, but preparation. The world is not deceived by the communist attempt to label Berlin as a hotbed of war. There is peace in Berlin today. The source of world trouble and tension is Moscow, not Berlin. And if war begins, it will have begun in Moscow and not Berlin. General Norstad did not react immediately to the news of East Berlin closing the border. In fact, in the morning of August 13, he was in his office at Shape, even though it was a Sunday. He sent two messages to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and neither of them even mentioned the crisis in Berlin. He later explained that the delay had been, quote, a policy action rather than a technical one. In other words, political authorities in Washington, London and Paris did not feel that a military response should be triggered immediately. This is significant. In order to explain the lack of an immediate NATO military response, it is worth clarifying that the construction of the wall was ultimately a defensive and not offensive action. The wall had been built on East German territory, and it did not interfere with the status of West Berlin. Also, there had been no interference with Allied access. The rights of the Western Allies in West Berlin were not affected. This is, therefore, a very different scenario from 1948. It was not a blockade. All of that is true. But at the same time, the West feared that tensions could soon escalate into open conflict. So, at this point, things started to move quite quickly. First, Live Oak was moved from its original headquarters at U.S. European Command in St. germain en laye near Paris, to shape headquarters in Rocancourt. The move was designed to facilitate a transfer of command responsibility for Live Oak from the three national occupied countries to NATO, should this crisis over Berlin escalate into a wider conflict in Central Europe. And when Shape moved to Mons in Belgium in 1967, Live Oak moved with it. In fact, there is a Live Oak building just behind our office at Shape today. The West Germans were invited to join Live Oak in 1961 to help devise con defense contingency plans for Berlin. During this critical time of transition, General Norstad was ever mindful of his three heads, Secur, Live Oak and U.S. Sinker. He explained that the non-Live Oak NATO members would not approve of any action without being first informed about the nature of the plans and the extent of military preparations that had taken place under Live Oak. General Norstad did not want to add lots of new but ultimately hollow divisions to NATO forces involved in the defense of West Berlin. He noted that no action should be taken without an improvement in the general posture of the existing military forces. He focused on increasing readiness for this new defensive effort and recommended, in the order of priority, strengthening of equipment and personnel levels in existing combat units, adding of fresh combat and service support units, and improvement in the status of the reserves. General Norstadt was also mindful of the need to maintain alliance cohesion and to ensure that all NATO allies approved. After all, although Live Oak was separate from NATO, all its contingency plans were based on the use of NATO military infrastructure, command and control structure, and potentially even NATO forces. In addition, any action taken under Live Oak would have immediate repercussions on all NATO members. Diego Ruiz Palmer explains the need for Live Oak plans to be linked to NATO defense strategy. The Allies knew that uh, under a full Soviet and East German attack, it would be very difficult to defend West Berlin without massive reinforcement uh, from West Germany. And furthermore, they were concerned that if they had to reinforce Berlin, uh, that would weaken NATO's defenses in West Germany uh, in order to reinforce uh, West Berlin. They were further concerned that a Soviet and East German attack on West Berlin might be a diversion uh, from a, a larger Warsaw Pact attack um, against West Germany and then uh, pushing deeper towards the North Sea. On August 21, 1961, more than a week after the wall had been under construction, 
General Norstad submitted his Life Oak developed Plan of Action to the North Atlantic Council. This plan caused immediate shock within the NAC, as up to that point, the members were not even aware that Life Oak existed. What caused even more uproar were references to, quote, the selective use of nuclear weapons to demonstrate the will and ability of the alliance to use them. Many leaders within the council feared that the four Live Oak powers, the UK, the US, France and the Federal Republic of Germany, could potentially bypass the NATO chain of command to give instruction directly to the Sacker without prior discussion and approval by the council. Secretary General Dirk Sticker argued that it was crucial to maintain the unity of the alliance and to follow the existing chains of command in both the political and military arenas. Sticker explained that the council would certainly not accept an outside authority giving instructions to Sacker. General Norstad shared Sticker's concerns. In September 1961, he wrote to Secretary of State Robert McNamara warning that, and I quote, we must keep in mind the fact that our NATO strategy must be generally acceptable to our allies if they are to have either the will to face up to possible military operations or the inclination to build up their forces. On October 25, 1961, in order to rapidly address the concerns at hand, the Council agreed the NATO military planning for Berlin would be controlled by the 15 NATO allies, not just the four Live Oak powers. While all of this is happening at SHAPE and NATO headquarters, time was passing. Slowly but surely, Khrushchev's six-month marker for the ultimatum expired without his threat being carried out. Berlin remained a divided city until November the 9th, 1989, when the wall came down. However, even with the wall gone, Live Oak remained active until the end of the Cold War in 1991. Somewhat ironically, the construction of the wall brought stability in the sense that it ironed out the border in Berlin. It stopped East Germans from leaving, and it ended any doubt about borders and spheres of influence in Western Europe. The Berlin Wall became a physical symbol of the Cold War, the stark division between Communist East Berlin and Democratic West Berlin. The Soviet bloc characterized the wall as a necessary protection against the degrading and immoral influences of decadent Western culture and capitalism. In the West, the wall became a symbol of oppression and totalitarianism. President Kennedy visited the wall in 1963 and gave a famous speech. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Kiwis, Romanus sum. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein Berliner. I want to say, on behalf of my countrymen who live many miles away on the other side of the Atlantic, who are far distant from you, that they take the greatest pride, that they have been able to share with you, even from a distance, the story of the last 18 years. I know of no town, no city, that has been besieged for 18 years that still lives with the vitality and the force and the hope and the determination of the city of West Berlin. <laughs> While the wall is the most obvious and vivid demonstration of the failures of the communist system. For all the world to see, we take no satisfaction in it, for it is, as your mayor has said, an offense not only against history, but an offense against humanity, separating families, dividing husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and dividing a people who wish to be joined together. What is true of this city is true of Germany. Real lasting peace in Europe can never be assured 
as long as one German out of four is denied the elementary right of free men, and that is to make a free choice. In 18 years of peace and good faith, this generation of Germans has earned the right to be free, including the right to unite their families and their nation in lasting peace with goodwill to all people. Throughout Live Oak's creation and the build-up to the Cold War, nuclear weapons were consistently mentioned and thought of as a means to balance military and political tensions, as we mentioned in our previous episodes. But nuclear war, rightfully so, made many nervous. And Cold War crisis did not end with Berlin. Less than a year later, in 1862, the world was once again brought to the brink of war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the Soviet Union and the U.S. were pitted against each other, and nuclear weapons were front and center once again. Both the Berlin and the Cuban Missile Crisis showed the limit of massive retaliation strategy and the risks associated with the nuclear arms race. The question became how could nuclear weapons help solve geographically localized and highly sensitive political crises? There was too much room for miscalculation and the risk of mutual destruction was just too high. And how should NATO react to threats that were below the level of an all-out attack and therefore did not warrant the use of nuclear weapons? The NATO allies started to think about new strategies that could allow more flexibility and reduce the risk of escalation into a nuclear war. In fact, one important consequence of the Berlin crisis of 1961 and of the Live Oak plans was an improvement in the alliance's conventional defense capabilities. This increase in conventional capabilities and in their readiness, along with the contingency plans developed for Berlin, paved the way for NATO's adoption of a new strategy. This is how the concept of flexible response was born in December 1967. To achieve effective deterrence on strategic, tactical and operational levels, it was essential to retain the capability to respond to an attack across the spectrum of warfare, including, but not limited to, the nuclear option. As Secretary of State McNamara explained at the time. Today we have a flexible fighting team ready to deal with any threat, whether it be large or small. We are superior to the communists and nuclear power, and we intend to stay that way. Flexible response led to the development of the nuclear triad. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers. The purpose of having this three-branched nuclear capability was to reduce significantly the possibility that an enemy could destroy all nuclear forces at first strike attack. The triad would ensure that a significant portion of nuclear forces would survive a first strike and could be deployed in retaliation. This possibility of a second strike naturally increased the strength of the deterrence factor. According to the Flexible Response Doctrine, if an attack occurred, NATO's response could range from direct defense, which means defense on the same level at which the enemy had chosen to fight. For example, if a Soviet attack in Europe across the Iron Curtain occurred, NATO would respond with conventional forces such as ground troops, air support, and maritime assets led by SACIR. The Alliance also had another option in the form of deliberate escalation. In the event of a conventional attack, NATO could choose to switch to a limited use of nuclear weapons. Deliberate escalation was possible due to the technological advances made in the early 1960s. The development of tactical nuclear weapons meant that the Alliance had nuclear capabilities that could be delivered with precision and lower explosive yields, limiting destruction to an extent while sending clear warning to the aggressor. The intent of deliberate escalation is to create uncertainty in the mind of the enemy and to make the costs of attaining their goals and objectives unacceptable. NATO retained a third option, general nuclear response or the ability to unleash a large-scale nuclear counterattack. This kind of response would cause an all-out nuclear war, which would lead to mutual assured destruction. Flexible response was officially included in the new NATO strategic concept of 1968, and remain in force until the end of the Cold War. The enemy could not predict with certainty how the alliance would respond to an attack. By introducing an additional element of unpredictability, the deterrent value of the nuclear strategy was increased. In the event of Soviet nuclear aggression, the Soviets knew they could not destroy all Allied nuclear capability. 
and that a second strike would certainly follow. That is why the nuclear triad and flexible response were tightly connected. Gregory Petlow explains why a flexible response was so successful in deterring Soviet aggression during the remaining decades of the Cold War. I think the key aspect of flexible response and its success over many decades was the fact that there was always an element of uncertainty for any a potential aggressor. They didn't know whether we would immediately respond with nuclear weapons, with conventional forces, what sort of escalation might take place. And the, the risks to the attacker were very great if it went up to the highest level of escalation. But because we did not promise something like massive retaliation, it was a credible threat to potential aggressors. If there is a silver lining to this time in the Cold War, it is the development of a military response plan that did not rely exclusively on all-out nuclear war. Unfortunately, however, the tensions between the Communist East and the Free West that led to the development of Live Oak would not diminish anytime soon, and the alliance is about to be thrown a curveball when NATO and SHAPE are forced to leave France. Tune in next time to find out more. We would like to thank all of our guests who appeared on this episode, and... Once again, we'd like to give a big shout out to Mass Communications Specialist Brett Dodge for being our producer and to Paul Magus and the NATO Public Diplomacy Division for opening their recording studio to us and making this possible. Thank you all for listening and tune in to our next episode. Yes.